Friends, maybe we'll draw ourselves to order. Uh, the microphone, Chris, seems to be working all right from back there. Uh, my name is Philip Barlow from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. We're so happy to welcome you to our event this afternoon. So um, pleased that Dr. Shi Leon from Duke University would come all the way across the country to um, join us. Um, I'll introduce him in a few moments, but we'll ask Brother um, Ryder Siemens to start our proceedings with a prayer, please. <clears throat> Writer is the boss of a part of my mind as my research assistant or <coughs> research boss. Thank you. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day. We're grateful to be here at BYU and <clears throat> for this opportunity. We're grateful for Dr. Shelian that he's come this way um, to Provo to share his research and to share his thoughts with us. We're grateful for the Maxwell Institute and the people who work there to uh, organize these events, to, um, these educational events that uplift and enlighten us. We're grateful for, to have the gospel in our lives. We're grateful for Jesus Christ and his example in our lives. And we pray today as we listen to Dr. She that we will um, be attentive, um, that we will absorb what we need to absorb, um, become better, better people from it. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dr. Leon and I have known each other for a long time, 30 years or so. Um, we taught together at a private small liberal arts college in Indiana, Hanover College, years ago, and he's gone on to the Divinity School at Duke University. He's a professor of world Christianity there, and his research focuses on China's modern encounter with Christianity. Uh, the, the material of the book that he's going to speak with us about today is his third book. His first one is The Conversion of Missionaries, which had to do, it's sort of like um, American Protestant missionaries meets Chinese nationalism in the early 20th century and with an accent on how the missionaries were changed in the encounter, something that ought to interest an audience like this. His second book was called Redeemed by Fire, The Rise of Popular Christianity in Modern China, which won Christianity's Today uh, 2011 Book Award, and it examines the development of missionary Christianity into a vibrant indigenous faith in the mainland. Um, all history is autobiography, as the saying goes, and she's family, uh, she grew up in a family that practiced Christianity on the underground in China when he was being um, raised. And um, two of his older brothers, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, Revolution, Mao's Cultural Revolution of the late 60s, early 70s, w um, were put out for re-education um, in agricultural settings. So his, um, he, he was four years of age when that happened, um, but he was living the history that he re later reflected on in wider disciplined context. Um, she is my friend enough that despite his impressive credentials, um, I can confide to you, I'm sorry to have to report to you that he's a fraud. Um, he's a fraud in a subtle way. We haven't really talked this over, um, maybe tonight. Um, his scholarship isn't fraudulent, it's authentic, and his resume is indeed impressive, and he, as you will see, carries himself with an authentic, quiet dignity. But he pretends, much as I pretend, not to have the physique of Cosmo, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Karl Malone, or Eric Kunzman, or someone like that. Beneath this pretense of being ordinary, however, a lion lurks. 
I first learned this in China after he had led me and several colleagues around uh, the land for a month or so, and we had gone up into Tibet for a time where my American germs tingled with Tibetan germs in a, some sort of giant warfare in my stomach and my head, and I wasn't feeling so well, and I was at 14,000 square feet and uh, came down a little woozy and he was leading us on um, a cruise down the Yangtze River on, as I remember, a five-star ship uh, that was rated five stars um, because of some sort of grade inflation, I think. Um, so by my reckoning, this was a fancy two-star, five-star boat and we were sailing down the Yangtze River, and um, we were, uh, had been on the river for a couple of days, and there was a little lull in the action, a quiet time. We were hours away, as I remember, from approaching the galactically famous Three Gorges, um, mountains that are as steep as our gorgeous um, Provo Mountains, but on the river, and they jut immediately from the river straight above and are all um, emerald like a New Zealand setting for a Harry Potter movie. Um, dramatic and wonderful, but it was a quiet time before then, and um, our, uh, another friend and I were wandering the five-star ship, and uh, we found a little quiet room with a ping-pong table in it, and I... Um, like to play ping pong, so that looked inviting. But then it dawned on my clever mind that I was in China on the Yangtze River, and the Chinese play ping pong. So we looked around, and providentially she appeared in the doorway. And so uh, my friend gave him a challenging southern drawl, stoic, sarcastic gauntlet, and so she. In his modest self had to be encouraged to take on this ping pong game, but um, his um, gentle, dignified, soft-spoken self went through a Jekyll and Hyde thing and he became a Chinese ping pong player all of a sudden, which means he rolled to the balls of his feet and sort of, what's that movie? Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, that's what it is. He became Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, athletic, agile. He would swing this way and then do four flips in the air and go like that. And it was astonishing what I saw. And the sign by which you will know that this is true is to pay attention now when he speaks because um, he is going to be his fraudulent self if history bears up my past observation of him, and he's going to speak softly. He's going to speak quietly. He is a gentleman, and he is what you Latter-day Saint folk would call humble, but um, he... Uh, English is not his native language. He didn't get around to being exposed, being raised in China uh, to English uh, until he was in his teens, and yet he speaks a more beautiful English than any of us here in this room. Uh, so there's music in the sound of it. Uh, so I'd invite you to pay most attention to what he says, but for the first few moments you might pay particular attention to how he says it. Um, verbally, um, he's got that move in, movie in him. Um, to end, I would say that he's come to talk to us about serious matters. Our church, for those of you who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, our church is a church of order, as I was trying to suggest at the conference on faith in a secular age um, last weekend. Our church is a church of order, and the virtues we most often encourage in ourselves are tailored to orderly times. Obedience, 
mercy, honesty, gratitude, forgiveness, generosity. What models ought we to look at, look toward in unsettled times? What kind of paragons for virtue ought we to look at in times of urgency or in times of oppression? He's come to talk to us about the case of Lin Zhao, who had the habit of writing her letters of protest in her own blood from prison. Shall we think also of other models? Do we want to emulate Lin Zhao or Moses in an era of slavery or Martin Luther King from a prison cell in uh, Birmingham or Sojourner Truth or to whom shall, or Joseph Smith, to whom shall we look in troubled times, urgent times, times of oppression? He will speak softly at Hanover College. She won annually the um, annual Nicest Human Award, which only I knew was going on at the college, but he was the annual winner. But the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder. She Leon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil. Um, thank you for your friendship. Um, I was really fortunate to become Phil's colleague and friend uh, so many years back at Hanover College. Thank you, Blair, and thank you everybody at the Maxwell Institute for having me here. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share the story of Lin Zhao. Um, <laughs> can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, it is a privilege for me to be at BYU because BYU has a very special place in the hearts and minds of Chinese people for the past 40 years. In January 1972, the United States and the People's Republic of China established full diplomatic relations. And then six months later, a performing group from BYU called the, the Young Ambassadors went on a tour in China. And they dazzled some 17,000 people across some major cities in, in China with a program that um, makes popular songs, uh, ethnic folk selections, Broadway tunes, uh, with a uh, Hawaiian fire and knife dance. And, um, and their performance was uh, reported, covered by all Chinese media across China and BYU or Yang Bohan Da Xie, as known in China, uh, became a household name overnight. Um, the young ambassadors brought their very spirited singing and dancing to a China, to a very different China than what we know now. Um, to catch a glimpse of that China, uh, we can turn to a, one of the very first Western reports on China um, after more than two decades of international isolation. And that report came from Connie Gerard, who was a BYU graduate of 1963. In 1972, she went to China when President Nixon made his historic visit to China. She was the executive assistant to the spokesman for the White House. And so she was there. And, um, and then she filed a report about that China. And um, she talked about all this grayness that she saw on the way uh, into Beijing. Gray buildings, gray walls behind which the, those uh, gray buildings lies. And then she wrote this. Let me read to you. All men and women were dressed alike in blue or gray baggy pants and shirt jackets. 
the atmosphere was one of austere drabness and sameness. The only color that she noticed was those uh, giant billboards, red background with white revolutionary slogans painted on them. But beyond that drabness and sameness and, and grayness was actually revolutionary passion that had been set on fire by Mao uh, when he launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966. So I want to show you a short clip from the Cultural Revolution from 1966. The reason for me to do that is to, um, to help you understand the backdrop, the kind of China that Lin Zhao was in when she was, when she embarked on this um, one person crusade against what she called the tyranny and, and slavery of Chinese communism. So again, this is a, a clip from 1966. What you're going to see is uh, Mao reviewing the Red Guards on Tiananmen Square. Um, I can find my... Now how do I click on the, the link of this? You're going to hear some very high-pitched sounds, so brace yourself for that. So that was the, um, okay. <coughs> so that was the, the China that, that was on fire um, with this cult of Mao. And that cult of Mao led to this brutal class struggle. Uh, at the time. Mao said that the, the class struggle had to be talked about every year, every month, and every day. Um, and the entire country was caught up in this, um, in, in practicing this revolution. And some of the, um, those high-pitched sounds that, that you heard uh, vowed to smash to smithering this old world and carry on the revolution to the very end, all their life. And at the same time that this was happening, you, you notice that the um, those red guards waving in their hand uh, this uh, a, a little the little red book that's the quotations of Chairman Mao. If you wonder what that red book says, let me read to you a couple of passages from it, and 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 you get a sense of the the kind of revolutionary doctrine that was being preached. Uh, this is a section called uh, classes and class struggle. Classes struggle. Some classes triumph. Others are eliminated. Such is history. Such is the history of civilization for thousands of years. And here's another one. Some of you may be familiar with this one. Amal wrote, a revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely, and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. So that was the gospel of the revolution that was being preached. And, and that led to um, waves of violence uh, across China. Uh, by the time that um, the hysteria died down. Up to two million people have perished. Uh, they were called unnatural deaths. 
as a result of the Cultural Revolution. So this was the kind, the, the sameness all over China that you will see at the time. And there you have, you have to picture, against this backdrop, you have to picture this one woman. Um, she was 34 years old at the time, in prison, writing her long letters to the People's Daily, to the editors of People's Daily, protesting against what she called the tyranny and slavery of communism, decrying this doctrine, this bloodthirsty doctrine of, of class struggle. And um, let, me, let me read to you one, one line um, that she wrote. She said, she wrote, I do not ever believe that in such a vast living space that God has prepared for us, there's any need for humanity to engage in a life and death struggle. And in fact, she warned against that violence, that cycle of, of violence that's going to catch everybody in it. Now, how could she hold out um, in such a time? What gave her the kind of moral clarity to, to uphold such a rare position um, against this, um, you know, what's like, like a jarring note in this chorus, in this symphony of Mao's revolution. Um, to understand that, we have to go back to her, to her past. Um, she was educated at the last two years of her high, of her high school at a mission school uh, found, founded by the Southern Methodist Church in 1903. It's called Laura Haygood Normal School. Its goal was to cultivate a kind of Christian modern womanhood in China. It was not, a, it was not an inexpensive school, as actually the tuition was several times the, the annual um, income of a day laborer. Um, her parents were, were of means, considerable means, so they sent her, uh, like many well-to-do Chinese family, to these mission schools to be educated. And um, so this is the, a portrait of, of Laura Haygood, after whom the school was named. And I, when I visited uh, Laura Haygood in 2013, this is a, a picture I took of the, the building that still stands there. Um, and some quick pictures of the the um, um, of of those students uh, and some of the activities that you see in this these pictures all from 1917. Uh, Ling Zhao would join these people would, would be on the campus of Laura Haygood um, in 1947. Okay. Uh, so you can see athletics being part of that, even mu music education, uh, very very nice dorms, and yes, chapel service. Lin Zhao is not in this picture, uh, but you can picture her being among these students. By the time she enrolled in Laura Haygood, religious observance was already made optional. It had been made optional for two decades. Um, and that was the, the, that was the circum circumstances under which she decided to become a Christian. She was baptized into the church. But it was more than a, um, a, a, a baptism into the church. It was actually sort of a baptized. She went through a double conversion, one to Christianity, but another to communism. And that's something that may be quite unthinkable for our time. It, um, how could people embrace both doctrines that seem so far apart? But in fact, for many Chinese patriotic uh, students in the 1940s, that was not an unusual thing because for many people, progressive young people, patriotic and progressive, uh, one of the kind, one kind of hopes that Christianity held out was uh, this reformism, how to make Chinese society a better society. And the difference between that and what the communists offered was the communists offered a utopian society, a complete remake of, of China. Uh, an egalitarian, just society without oppression, without any kind of injustice. And it seemed that the church was not willing to go quite as far as the communists were uh, through violence. And so 
she was drawn to this vision of a perfectly beautiful society. And so she, at considerable risk to her life, she joined the Communist Party as an underground member at the age of 16. And she was printing this uh, mimeograph, uh, party propaganda uh, sheets for the party. And um, I won't be able to go into the details. Uh, after the Communist takeover, she joined the uh, what was called the late the land reform teams, and this is a photograph showing her uh, with a with her comrades in one of these work teams that the party has sent out. The party sent out thousands of these work teams into the countryside to do several things: to do the land redistribution, land redistribution, to struggle against the landlords, and uh, more than a million landlords were killed uh, through this street. Uh, you know, justice, um, what they call the People's Court. And also the land reform teams will do this um, land um, grains requisitions for, for, the, for the state. So she threw herself into the revolution believing that this revolution will bring about such a, a classless society uh, with no oppression. And um, so these are some of the pictures that she took while she was a member of the work team. She began to, to pick up signs of the hypocrisy of the revolution, but she refused to believe that something was wrong with this revolution. She thought it was only wrong with some of the party's colors. Um, in 1954, because of her spectacular uh, so academic performance and, and, and Credentials. She was admitted to the most prestigious university in China, that was Peking University. And here's a picture showing her with her uh, fellow students. And you can see in this picture, many of them uh, were uh, not in their teens. They were in their 20s when they became freshmen at college. That's because uh, the, uh, many of these were recruited from people who already had considerable work experience and really distinguished themselves in more than one way. And so she flourished at Peking University as a poet. She joined the, the, the poetry club. She worked, she worked as an editor for the, for the student newspaper. And uh, she was a, quite a, 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 a good scholar in ancient Chinese literature. But then came 1956, 1957. In 1956, Mao, Mao Zedong launched what was called the 100 Flowers Campaign. And, uh, which is such a beautiful name for, for that campaign. And the idea was that uh, let a hundred flowers bloom, let everybody speak out and to criticize the party, to make the party improve its, help the party improve its work. And when the intellectuals took the bait and actually spoke out after repeated assurance from Mao that you won't be, you won't be held responsible for what, no matter what kind of criticism, and he did exactly the opposite of what he promised, and he launched the so-called anti-rightist campaign to punish, uh, quite brutally, all those who had spoken up against the party. Lin Zhao had also spoken up, uh, calling for democracy, but she actually she did it in a relatively mild manner, and even for that, she was um, uh, denounced as a rightist. And there were punishments for those rightists. Some were sent to prison, some were sent to labor camp. And uh, she was also forced to go through what was the program called the re-education through labor. And that was the point of her break with communism. Finally, after all these years um, of trying to believe in communism, then came this uh, betrayal of the intellectuals, this, this brutal crackdown on intellectuals. And that was the moment of her, uh, of her disillusionment. And later on, she wrote a poem to, uh, to mark that moment. And let me read to you the poem that she wrote. A sudden gale comes toward me from heaven, and a melody drifts from the bamboo flute, plunging the world in gloom. The black Chrysanthemum opens its pure heart at the approach of night, and the plum blossom, iron boned in the frost, goes into bloom. 
Now, the plum blossom in Chinese poetry has always been this, has always has this um, symbolism of, um, you know, I am boned in a frost of, of great resolve and um, um, tenacity and will and goes into bloom when all the other flowers have already died out. And so that was her moment of embarking on, re on descent against Mao. And her act of descent was to write two long poems, one of which, one of which was called a, a Day in Prometheus Passion, in which she presented Mao as this, as this villainous Zeus that was, was filled with rage, impotent rage against the fire, that had been, the fire of, um, over the fire of freedom that had been taken from heaven. And he tried to force Prometheus to take back the fire, to put out the fire, um, unsuccessfully, of course. And she also helped launch an underground journal to expose the, the colossal failures of what was called the Great Leap Forward that Mao had launched in 1958. And many of you know that the Great Leap Forward was the single greatest man-made famine in human history. Between 1959 and 1961, it claimed at least 36 million lives. And uh, so Lin Zhao worked with working with some other writers, uh, students in the countryside, who work in the countryside, try to publish this underground journal to expose the, um, the colossal failures of the Great Leap Forward. For that, uh, they were all rounded up and thrown into prison. Lin Zhao was charged as being a lead member of this counter-revolutionary clique. Now, for most people, that's where the story would end. Because what do you do after you get thrown into jail? Well, you, you accept thought reform. You understand that for the Chinese communist, the penal system, the doctrine was reform. That the party was not content with the, the conquest of the country. It would only be content with the conquest of the mind. So for ideological totalism. I want you to, to, to be totally converted and turn around to sing praises of the party and to hope for a sort of leniency. And that's exactly what the uh, almost all Chinese intellectuals, um, the kind of uh, default position that they went into. Um, because it was pointless by that time, it was pointless to, to resist that thought reform. But then Lin Zhao took the other road and decided to resist. And that's why her trouble continued. Um, so, she was thrown into, into prison. This is the prison that she was eventually put into. Uh, but it, before this, she was, she was put into what was called the, the Shanghai Number One Detention House. That was a detention house, a place for interrogation just for political um, prisoners. Some of you may find this kind of um, layout familiar. If you visited the, uh, the uh, Alcatraz, uh, Alcatraz uh, the, the prison setup is very much like, like this. And the reason for the similarity is that the Tilan Chao prison, where Lin Zhao was thrown into, uh, these buildings were, were, were completed in the 1930s, and they were actually modeled on the American prison. So that's why you have this similarity. Uh, you have this open space uh, between uh, these floors, and eventually you, you can picture Lin Zhao reading her blood letters through this iron grill so that not only the inmates in, in neighboring cells could hear her, but even people from a different floor could hear her reading her protest letters. In the meantime, she was thrown into number one detention house, and of course everybody, you are expected uh, to confess, um, and, um, and then to, uh, to, to accept punishment, but Lin Zhao resisted that. And because she did not uh, cooperate with the interrogators, she was uh, tortured. And the typical form of torture at the time, you know, the Communist Party, after it came to power, uh, very early in the 1950s, it has drawn up in the Constitution, in the Chinese Constitution, constitution um, and, and other administrative directives, the party made it very clear, no torture in prison. So the 
uh, the, the, the rules were there, but uh, just nobody paid attention to those rules. And the, the, the most um, frequent form of punishment in prison was actually not beating. Lin Zhao was beaten. She was roughed up variously. Uh, at various uh, occasions, uh, her hair were, to were torn out, leaving some holes or patches. Uh, but that was not the most terrifying form of punishment. Um, the most frequent form of punishment was a punitive handcuffing. This is not the kind of handcuffing that, that comes to mind. Um, Lin Zhao, for a time, she was put into two pairs of handcuffs, one on her, on her wrist and the other on her upper arms, on the back. So handcuffing on the back. In, at one uh, point, she was put into a uh, handcuff for six months. Uh, even when she was writhing in pain um, for her stomach um, pain, she said they did not, not only did they, they did not re, um, even remove one pair of uh, handcuffs to, to alleviate suffering. So that was the kind of torture that she was subjected to. And of course, writing instruments were taken away. So the only form of protest writing that she could do was with her own blood. So she poked her own fingers with whatever sharp objects she could find, a, a sharp bamboo, bamboo prick, or a hair clip, or uh, at some point, uh, the, the back, the handle, the plastic handle of her toothbrush after it was ground against the concrete floor to draw blood and then to write poem. And her earliest blood writing that I know of was done as she adopted the most ancient Chinese form of poetry, four character lines. It was also a matter of necessity uh, when you're handcuffed and uh, you cannot write a whole lot. So she pricked her finger and she, uh, she did that writing on her shirts using this very short poetic form to do her, to do her, her, her protest. But even in the midst of that, she held out hope that something might change. She prayed for Mao. Let me read to you a passage. Still she at times clung to the hope that Mao might somehow repent. In 1963, after her rearrest, she had, quote, pray for his soul, unquote. Quote, after all, I am a Christian, she explained. She said, I had neither the right to offer forgiveness in the place of the Heavenly Father, nor the right to prevent the Heavenly Father from forgiving him. What if Mao, quote, reproaches himself in sorrowful repentance and moves heaven's heart, she wondered. Um, but she refused to, to confess. And so eventually she was sentenced to 20 years in prison in, in 1965. And um, most people, what you do after you're thrown into, into prison, you start to write your confessions. That's what every inmate um, did. She instead embarked on huge writing projects, one of which was this 137-page letter to the editors of People's Daily, in which she laid out her case against communism. She decried what the Communist Party had done to turn Mao into a modern-day emperor in Marxian garb. She protested against the trampling of what she calls the God-given um, human rights, her freedom. And um, she started more blood writings. And um, let me read to you one of the passages in which she mixed this prophetic outcry against the tyranny of communism with her vow of non-violent principle of, for her resistance and her recognition and her compassion for even her persecutors. This is from the letter to People's Daily. And she made it very clear that her resistance was based on her Christian principles and convictions. As a Christian, my life belongs to my God. In order to stick to my path, or rather my line, the line of 
a servant of God, the political line of Christ, this young person paid a grievous price. She liked to refer to herself in third person. Um, I have come to see more clearly and deeply the many terrifying and shocking evils committed by your demonic political party. I grieved and wept for them. Yet even when I touched the darkest, the most terrifying, the bloodiest, and the most savage center of your power, the core of evil, I still glimpsed, I did not completely overlook the occasional sparks of humanity in you. Then I cried in even, in even greater anguish. I cried for your blood-smeared souls, which are unable to rid themselves of evil and are dragged by its terrifying weight ever deeper into the swamp of death. Most likely, you will find you feel quite indifferent when you read this line. But as I write this, hot tears are rushing into my eyes. Gentlemen, those who enslave others can never be free. What a merciless but certain truth in your case. So there she was, there she was. you can picture her crouching forward on her, the, the concrete floor of her cell because there was no desk unlike uh, Alcatraz. There's no desk for, for her to write. And this is a, um, a view from, from the hotel room that I checked into, the closest hotel room I could find bordering the, um, the prison. And you see this uh, uniform color, uh, these aluminum shutters outside those uh, windows with iron bars so that no light can be let out. So at night, it's total darkness. Um, and Lin Zhao's cell, if I can find a way to point at, um, this is the this, this is the building, a T-shaped building of women's ward, and she was eventually put in one of the uh, cells on the on the fifth floor here. But she continued to write away. This is her what she called a protest slogan, um, using again a four character lines um, that she wrote on the seventh anniversary of her arrest. So because of this kind of unbending resistance and as the Cultural Revolution um, picked up steam, the prison officials and the Shanghai uh, labor reform, um, it's called uh, Reform Through Labor uh, Bureau, changed her sentence from 20 years to death penalty. But she was unaware um, of, of this. And um, so I'm running out of time. Um, so she kept on her writing. And um, to protest against all kinds of tortures she, um, and abuse that she suffered um, in, in prison, she then embarked on these blood writings, uh, blood letters to her mother. Let me read to you just one short passage from one of the blood letters she wrote to her, to her mother uh, just a few months before her execution. Um, this was toward the end of a, um, a blood letter she, she, she wrote. I wanted to write some more, but I'm very tired. Those without the experience won't know, although you don't bleed a lot when you write a blood letter, yet it drains your mental energy. Moreover, I have already written three protest statements in blood today. I cannot help it. I am practically speaking in my own blood every day. However, they see it as, as usual and nothing startling. I am tired. Let me write you again tomorrow, my mama. I wish you from afar peaceful dreams tonight. And in fact, after that, then she went on to, um, to read her blood letters to the, 
to the fellow inmates. So as a result of that, um, the death sentence uh, was finally approved, and then on April 29th, 1968, uh, there was a sort of show trial, public trial, inside Tilan Chao prison in the 10, in a 1,000 um, seat auditorium. And uh, after this public trial, then she was shot um, inside prison. And um, then the public security, the police, uh, sent someone to her home and um, demanded that her family pay a five cent bullet fee because as a counter-revolutionary, she had wasted a people's bullet. Um, just before the execution, in the last few weeks of Lin Zhao's life, this is what she looked like. She was put into what was called a monkey king cap. Because she was reading, she was protesting, she was making sounds. So in order to prevent her from contaminating, contaminating the ideal, sorry, prevent this ideological contamination of fellow inmates, they put her in this um, this rubber hood, pull this over her, her face, that, and they will only remove that during meal time and put it back on. Um, during this time, she was almost certainly in chains. Um, so Lin Zhao, I'll leave this on for just a few minutes. Um, so Lin Zhao was one of those many, many victims of the Cultural Revolution, except she was not just a victim. After Mao died, in the early years of Deng Xiaoping's reform, uh, in order to um, correct the political excesses of, Mao's, of the Mao era, the, 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 the party state um, decided to do this political rehabilitation of all those who have been wrongly accused and persecuted through the Cultural Revolution. And Lin Zhao's case was reopened, and the Shanghai People's Court reviewed her case twice and in both cases uh, declared her innocent and threw out the death penalty. And then her prison writings were returned to the family. I was able to interview the judge who finally decided to put her those writings in what he called a secondary file and return that to the family. And that's how we came to have Lin Zhao's prison writings. And since then, and in the, particularly in the last decade or so, Lin Zhao has really become a symbol for uh, this search for civil society, for democracy in China, because there was just not another person during that time period who stood up against the ideology and the practice of communism, which is why the late Nobel Peace Laureate Liu Xiaobo called her the only voice of freedom left for contemporary China. And so her tomb had become a pilgrimage site uh, every year on April the 29th, people would come and pay tribute to her, and police would show up, sometimes in, in, in gear, sometimes plain clothes police, to turn those, um, the pilgrims away. And um, this is a democracy activist in his 60s. Uh, his name is Zhu Chengzhi. Last year, at the, for the 50th anniversary of her execution, he went with three other democracy activists. They knew the police had already been there for a month, and police would show up on the 29th. So he and the friends show up on the night of April 28th, just before midnight, crawling under this fence that the police had built. The fence was not there when I visited Lin Zhao's tomb in 1913, so this is re re relatively new. And so he crawled under, brought this bouquet of flowers, and to present that to Lin Zhao's, uh, at Lin Zhao's tomb. And just a few minutes after that, police arrived and took him away, put him under this detention, and then six months later, charged him with the crime of picking quarrels and uh, stirring up trouble. And he remains in jail until this day. Um, time is, I'm running out of time, but let me, allow me to read a poem that Lin Zhao's classmate from Peking University wrote, where he himself emerged from 22 years of banishment as a writer to learn about her death. And because there has never been an event like this in China 
to publicly, openly commemorate Lin Zhao. Please allow me to read this poem first in Chinese and then in English, and I will end there. The poem is, in, is entitled Lamplight in the Snowy Fields Remembering Lin Zhao Xiedi Zhi Deng Huai Nian Lin Zhao Bu Zhi Dao Wei Shema Wo Zong Huai Nian Shan Na Bian De Yi Zhan Deng Zai Leng Wu Qi Mi De Ye Wan Zai Bai Mang Mang Xiedi Zhong Yang Mei Li De Gu Du De 凛然不可侵犯的亮着，在他光芒所及的地方，尽可能远的摒弃着。风卷积雪的，浓深的夜。For some reason, I always miss the lamplight on the other side of the mountain, on a desolate night filled with a cold fog, in the middle of the fields covered with white snow. Is shown a beautiful, lonely, inviolable light, where its radiance touched it cast as far off as it could the thick, dark night of windswept, deep snow. Thank you. We have a little bit of time for questions to Professor Leon. Um, after we address those, I brought very few books, like eight or nine books, that we'll put out in the table out in front if any of you are interested um, in purchasing them. They cost us $21, and they'll cost you $20 because we're challenging capitalism at the Maxwell Institute. Um, <laughs> And um, she, I hope I'm not presum presumptuous in saying, would be willing to sign those um, upon request if anyone wants to wait. That will, um, after we take some time for questions, it'll probably take us three or four minutes to get she out at that table. Um, but if you'd state your question loudly and um, make sure there is a question rather than an elaborate um, um, talk of your own. Uh, you might keep the question reasonably succinct and she, I'll ask you to re-articulate the question as you understand it since we're being recorded here. So any any queries from you? Okay. Yes. Thank you. The, the, the question is, uh, what's the current feelings in China about Lin Zhao? Do many people uh, know about Lin Zhao? Um, sadly, um, the relatively, relatively um, few number of people know about Lin Zhao. And that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, the media, of course, is controlled by the, by the party state. The internet did open up a space um, some democracy, democracy activists um, are quite familiar with Lin Zhao and, and of course this is annual pilgrimage and social media has helped. There's no way for me to gauge the, the kind of inference. Um, this is um, the New York Review of Books uh, had a review of, 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 of Black Letters uh, written by Ian Johnson and Ian Johnson made a very interesting point and that is the um, Lin Zhao, like Liu Xiaobo, the, no the Nobel Peace Prize uh, um, laureate, uh, many people inside China do not know who Liu Xiaobo is. And for the same reason, and pe perhaps to the same extent, uh, they do not know who Lin Zhao is. Uh, so we'll find out. Um, uh, I, hope, I hope more people will know about Liu Xiaobo and will know Lin Zhao. Yes.
Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the question is, on what ground did the, court, the high people's court in, in, in Shanghai um, basically clear Lin Zhao of all the, all the, um, the, the, um, the charges um, and declare her, pronounce her innocent? Um, well, they look at evidence. What, uh, what are the evidence of the so-called counter-revolutionary crimes? And well, if you look into the evidence, she had written two poems, two long poems against Mao. And she did protest against the slavery. She, she used the word, and I have not come, and other historians of Chinese, um, the, um, of modern China, the Cultural Revolution, we've not come across other people using the term totalitarianism in reference to, 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 um, to the communist um, um, dictatorship. And so, um, but she used the word, she, and then she, she uh, again, accused the party of being, um, of practicing tyranny and, and slavery. So these are the, um, the, the charges, these were the evidence of a crime, and they, they looked at the evidence, they decided it was just, they simply did not constitute crime. Yes? What is the present status of the communist How do they play their historical happenings, such as cultural revolution? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And the question is, how do the Chinese government present its history to tell its story about the making of um, of China that has led China to to the current stage? Um, it's interesting how how important history can be to the rulers, um, and how important it is for the um, the party state to have its version of of history. There's a recent, there's a recent actually, uh, rewriting of Chinese history. After Mao died in the early years of the Deng Xiaoping era, the party uh, acknowledged, admitted, that uh, the Cultural Revolution was 10 years of catastrophe. The party leadership under Xi Jinping has recently declared that they have chosen a new term, no longer 10 years of catastrophe. It's called, now it's called 10 years of arduous seeking. And, um, and so the, um, the, 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 the excesses, the violence of the Cultural Revolution, the, um, the deaths of the Great Leap Forward, all those, and the massive waves of political campaigns, each one of them sent so many people to their unnatural deaths. It's all been whitewashed. And so you, you, you again have this glorious party leading China from a period when China was under was being bullied by all these Western imperialist powers and finally led China to become a, the mighty nation that it has come, become today. Yes? Could you say a little bit about the impact of Lin Zhao's prosecution on her faith? Did it strengthen her faith? Did it weaken it? Did she feel that God has abandoned her? <coughs> that she represents the figure? Thank you. Thank you. That's such an important question. In fact, if you look at her prison writings, you have to realize that her faith, Christian faith, lies right at the heart, right at the center of her resistance. About her, the practice of her faith in prison cells that were deprived of any religious material, how could she carry that on? Uh, in my book I mentioned, uh, based on my research of her prison writings, the journals that she kept, every Sunday morning at 9.30, she began what she called grand church service of one person in her prison cell, singing hymns from the days of her, uh, from her Laura Haygood um, days, and uh, reading scriptures. There was also one account, uh, one, one uh, detail that she, she um, wrote about. There were these prison struggle meetings, 
And some of the prisoners were there actually for their faith. And, um, and there, was, there were some cases of apostasy. Christians giving up under tremendous pressure to give up their faith. So once there was this struggle, and, um, and, and, and Lin Zhao just stormed into that and say, for how many pieces of silver did you sell Jesus? So, I mean, that, that was quite an aside from, from her own political struggle. But while she was there, she was constantly searching for signs of God's approval. You can imagine, it's a completely hopeless and suicidal kind of protest and opposition that she carried on. So she would continue, she would pray and she would continue to look for signs. She would even look out of the window at when, when, when it snowed. She would say, thank God. Um, when, when it snowed, she, she saw the snow as God approving of her struggle. And she was, I mean, the prison took away her, her water, you know, so she did not have access to water. So once there was this crack in the ceiling, and it leaked, and she wrote to her mother about it, this, she called it, the Heavenly Father had poured water into my, into my prison cell as a sign of, of God's approval of her continuing struggle and protest. So absolutely, she, without that faith, it would not have been possible to carry out this pointless, you know, otherwise pointless uh, opposition. There was, there's a hand there, I could, yes. I do have personal connections, and um, more in terms of my childhood memory, um, Professor Barlow mentioned that I was four years old when the Cultural Revolution broke out, and I remember when I was four years old one, one day, I was looking out the, um, this, um, our apartment, little apartment, uh, we had an apartment in the downtown section of Wuzhou, uh, looking out the window, and I saw these um, crowds converging, agitated crowds converging in the intersection of this downtown uh, um, center, and I saw people, some people riding, sitting on the, those <coughs> protruding uh, bumper, metal bumpers from military trucks, throwing glass bottles into the, into the crowds. And that was my, you know, my, um, my, my first memory of, um, of the Cultural Revolution. But I was introduced to this to Lin Zhao's story quite by chance. I won't go into all the details, but um, I did not go out to search for her story. But when I heard about her, and I watched a, a documentary film, it's available on YouTube if you're interested. It's called Searching for Lin Zhao's Soul. It's in Chinese with very minimal English translation. So that introduced me to Lin Zhao's story. And then I embarked on my search for that story to read to dig up her writings, to interview people who, who had known her. Yes? Um, I, think it's, I think it's really helpful for all of us to understand a lot of the historical context of things that are happening in China today. Um, but then there's also a lot of sometimes fear-mongering that happens in America about what's going on yes. with China yeah. and, and the oppressiveness of the government. Yeah. And so I guess I wanted to ask you, I've been hearing a lot of things about how like things are getting worse in China. Um, that there's been increasing in censorship, increasing in arrests, such as the one that you described. And I wanted to ask for your perspective on whether or not we should be concerned, and whether or not China is on a negative trajectory. Thank you. That's a very important question. The question is um, um, whether we can. Uh, I guess if I, if you allow me to reinterpret, um, to rephrase your question, um, whether we can paint a kind of a very, a very dramatic picture of China, showing China as in the grip of, of this very authoritarian government, ignoring the progress that has been made, and what would be a uh, sort of more balanced way of, of depicting China. I really appreciate that question. It's, it's a wonderful question, it's, but it's also a very hard one to address, um, depending on how we measure the progress, the changes that have been made. In terms of lifting people out of poverty, 
the party has claimed it's, it has its, its huge success in living, lifting people out of poverty. But I'm not quite sure how much the party can take credit for simply standing back from the kind of ruinous policy or reversing the ruinous policy that it had implemented for so many years. Because when you look at Taiwan, which is not under communist rule, um, it is a much more balanced, much better developed civil society um, in terms of its wealth, in terms of its, um, the freedoms and rights that people enjoy. But uh, I must say that in terms of material progress, there has been considerable. But also, even in terms of some, some kind of freedoms um, to, do, um, to make money, um, there has been um, you know, changes, uh, sort of expanded space for some kind of um, some, some particular kind of civil liberties, as long as you do not touch politics. But when it comes to politics, one is a very clear trend in more recent years is a reversal of the opening of the Deng Xiaoping era toward a much more authoritarian style of, of ruling the country. And that's very worrisome, where you have all those uh, democracy activists and so many other democracy ac activists, those um, human rights lawyers being put behind bars, charged with bogus crimes, uh, that is worrisome. Yes? It was a very difficult project to work on. Um, I, all these years, I've, I've been filled with admiration for this incredible courage and tenacity of this young woman. And I felt as if, I, you know, I caught glimpses at this, this boundary of human spirit. Um, its capacity for hope, for compassion, and but also its tenacity. Um, so filled with admirations, but um, as you can imagine, it was very depressing kind of project to 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 work on. So I had to, I actually had to start a a separate, a second project, a simultaneous project uh, that was more heartening. ask you one final um, question, she, um, part of this is informed by private conversations we've had off screen here, but um, Lin Zhao resisted, so if I ask myself really hard questions, it sounds admirable, historically looking back, it sounds admirable from the safety of the United States. If Lin Zhao was my daughter, would I, is that, would I encourage this path? Um, it's all heroic, but couldn't somebody else's daughter do it? I don't know what sort of feelings I might have about that. So there's questions like that in the background feel free to ignore or address. But um, Lin Zhao resisted and others didn't. And what made the difference? And you started your lecture that way. And to understand, we have to go back in time. So you gave us some autobiographical glimpses. But um, I'm not sure you came back at the end of your lecture with a summary statement of, to understand that, what would you say is a summary statement? What, what enabled her to do this? Um, thank you. First of all, I would, I would say that um, as parent, um, any parent uh, would find this um, inconceivable and would, would, would rush to stop her. In fact, her mother did. Uh, while during, even during her last months in, in prison, she would get a letter from her mother and say, Mother would tell her, please listen to those comrades, in, those cousins in prison, and stop this nonsensical behavior, these nonsensical things. And she'll write back, she said, who is being nonsensical? 
Am I the one or is it the party? No. And to her, it was just impossible to, for her to stop. Furthermore, it actually brought up some moral dilemma for her because she was not just sacrificing herself. That was clear. She made it clear to the editors of People's Daily that um, God willing, I will live on. But if God wants me to become a... She, her words was, if God wants me to become a, a willing martyr, I see it as my honor to do that, to become one. So that part was clear for her. But then there, was, there were implications for the family. Because of her, her family, her family became political pariah. And it was very hard on the family. And she was asking for her mother to send supplies to prison. I need more, another bottle of ink, pen, and notebook, so she can do more writing. And the, 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 the finances, the financial burden on the family was, was huge. And she, she, all, she recognized all that. And she recognized what a burden this has been. Just because she was trying to live, in, to live out her faith. What a burden and, um, it has been for the family. But she also came to a point when she decided, I, I, I cannot. I cannot help it. I'm sorry, but I cannot help it. I have to, even when she recognized that this was unfair to, to the family. So, to the next, the, the, the other question about what enabled Lin Zhao to do that, um, I've already tried to address it to some extent, and there's this deep conviction that she was doing this as a Christian duty. Um, to give you a contrast, and maybe I'll end with this one, um, secular opposition, all these secular um, ideals that people have, um, that her generation of intellectuals had acquired, were no match for this machinery of oppression because it has succeeded in, in oppressing and silencing just about everybody. In the same prison that Lin Zhao was kept, in Tilan Chao prison, at the same time, there was a Yale-educated Shakespearean scholar by the name of Sun Dayu. He had been named by Mao as one of the unrepentant uh, writers and thrown into Tilan Chao prison. And one day, during the Cultural Revolution, he, he explained to the guards that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I have no time to write my confessions of my crime because, because I'm so busy copying every day Chairman Mao's works. That's how one can be broken. And without faith, Lin Zhao would have been broken. But I think it's her Christian faith that made a difference. And she was not broken. Thank you. <laughs>